programming the firing for the main battery. Switchboards over here just pass signal through. And this is the main panel for the main battery. Now, the problem we're doing here is fire control. Two things you need. I mean, all this propulsion and you know, command and that sort of stuff, it just hauls the guns around. It's all about guns. So you got gunnery and you got fire control. The problem we have to solve in fire control, other than right hand coordination here, was we have our target ship out here and we have the Texas back here. We're going to need six things to fire on that ship and succeed. We need to know the location of us. We'll need to know the location of the target. We'll need to know our course and speed and the course and speed of the target. How we get that very good time. But that's our problem. Here's our target bearing. Here's a target range. And I'll tell you how we got there. So we didn't start out in this location. This wasn't available until we built the ship. We started out in a, a space not called plot. It was called subcentral. And it was a little space, just starboard, not called battery charging. Physically, that same space. Bulkheads changed. Uh, and that was where the plotting was done. And literally, it was plotting. If you wanted to track your ship, you didn't have a, a uh, range to figure out, a, a uh, ranging system to figure out from a loft where they were. You had range finders, and you originally had the uh, periscopes in the turrets. Now, there's an evolution even before that. So, 19, in 1848, uh, Commander Dahlgren, uh, the gentleman for whom uh, Dahlgren Proving ground was named, uh, instituted sites on Navy Pens, 1848. Seems obvious before then, but that's when they put them on. Uh, time wound on. Uh, things got easier for fire control. Uh, the concept of firing locally was good at shorter ranges, and you know, and Dahlgren said he was looking at you know 2,000 yards was a maximum. <coughs> Come forward, uh, the uh, HMS Dreadnought comes out. Life has gotten simpler. The Dreadnought concept put all the main battery guns on the center line of the ship and the same caliber. That means that you could centrally direct those guns. So we came up with gun directors. In 1911, uh, Scott, the Royal Navy, put a gun director on the Neptune. I have first gun director aloft rather than being in the turrets. The Texas was commissioned in uh, 1914, and so we came out with director firing. We have gun directors aloft on the cage masts, and we had the local directors in the turrets, and we had one for the gunnery officer in the fire control booth at half of the conning tower. Uh, and that's, that's the way we came out, and that's how we fed our original plot. But things got better. Things got better. 19, well, after the Battle of Jutland, uh, the Navy boys went down to the, in the Navy Yard, Washington Navy Yard, went down to Starbucks and said, you know, I think they were shooting better with those really ornate dammers and things, computers that British were using. So they, they said, let's, let, we ought to try it. So they went out and they went out to two, two people, Sperry, a logical choice, the guy who made the gyros, and an upstart actually spun out of Sperry, Hannibal Ford, who founded Ford Instrument. And he didn't want to make searchlights forever. He didn't mind being a captive contractor to the US Navy. And he got on the job concept was put out to them in 1915, 1916. They produced the prototypes. Now, Ford produced his on time. They were going to test it in the New York and in the Texas, just like we tested radar later on. Well, we were putting our computer, uh, Ford was putting his computer on the Texas, and he got it done in 1916. It was put on. They sailed in the fall. And lo and behold, it was the computer they had, and it's the one they wanted. And they approved it, and you'll see that the two over here, they're pedestal-mounted computers, mechanical analog computers, uh, tested on the Texas in 1916, the first fire control computer in the USA put out to the fleet in 1917. Mechanical analog computers, and there are boxes about so by so by so and hundreds of pounds, just full of gears and shafts and screws and all the wonderful things 
that you use for analog computing, some of which you can actually see in here, which is just a plot. All right, so we have we have those. What are we going to do with them? We put them out. Well, we can, we need more space. So the expanded plot area from those two plotting tables, which which held plotting tables, some speed indicators, which were basically rudder, I mean uh, shaft speed, and these Charles Corning Sun methods of getting signal out to the turrets. We, we expanded that forward. And so the section that now has motor generators in it was part of the expanded plot. When they put in these pedestal mounted computers, first one, and then later on they put in two. The next innovation though was the Sperry Fire Control System. So it comes in about, for us, about uh, 1920. And it was a way to get around the coordination problem. If you're up aloft and you're calling down target bearing and you're calling through a speaking tube and you're expecting to get all the way down the clock to set the differential, it's not good. So they start having battery power telephones, casually issue if you break the circuit, but the Sperry system came in and it was direct current. It had a stepper switch system. So you rotated a telescope up aloft, the gun director, to give you target bearing. And it went click, 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 click down here. And that not only went click, click, click down here, it went click, click, click out in the turrets. So you didn't have a relay problem, it just passed through here and on out. The one thing that was added in the plot was we needed a deflection. We needed to put the leads in. And as well, uh, for range, they would have to go to the ballistics table. Uh, there's a page of it here. Uh, they calculate, OK, so that's your range. I need to put in this elevation. And they would call that out to the turrets. Uh, that Sperry system, it was better than what they had for sure. What it didn't, and they had some indicators that went back and forth so they could double check their calculations. Uh, but it did have a disadvantage that it was running on direct current. Direct current meant that if the power went off, the stepper switch got out of sequence when the turret rotated, and they had to go back to mechanical zero to reset the system so they could direct it. That's a real problem in a combat situation if you have to take it casually. So, Time moved on again to our advantage. Uh, the Battleship Texas was lucky they got rebuilt after the Washington Naval Treaty. So in 1925 to 27, we took everything down to the keel back here. And lo and behold, this space became available. Part of boiler room number one became the new plot. It's lower. It's better protected. It's a little warm because we still have a boiler back here. We have a, a dynamo up here, and we have heated fuel oil underneath. Hence, later on, the air conditioner is put on 1944, 1945. But it's a better situation, more more room. We have a raised computer room floor that, that you're sitting on. <coughs> and at the same time, we put in the GE fire control system. This was an AC system, alternating current, and they used synchro motors, Celsius. So a lot, you turned your director, and down here, a slave rotor turns down in the computers. Uh, if power goes, fades, comes back, it'll resync itself. That's a big advantage for you. They used to bring the signal down. They also used to send corrections or uh, bearing back up so that in the director, they could look through the telescope, and if the computer wasn't telling the point in the right direction, they could put a correction in the computers. We had two computers here. We also still have the pedestals here. We still had to get our ship speed out, and that was that was put in for the speed indicators. Uh, that calculation is done in the forward gyro room. Uh, so we feed our, our computers down here, we send it out, but we need more space. So the new, improved forward range keeper, Mark 1, Body 11, shown here, has a cabinet underneath that same computer. And there's a picture of it back here. That housed the synchro motors and housed the synchros to send it signal back out to the turrets. So if you've been under, or will be under, the guns and look at the, the uh, pointer and trainer locations, those indicators in front were sourced from the signals coming out of our computers here, right on out. The computer put in the corrections they needed, so they just had a follow the needle system out there. They're the end of the, of the servo system. They were the feedback. And that, that's how we ended up with our location here. So we know what we need to do. Uh, what did it look like physically? Well, let's start with what we can see. If we look for the bow backwards towards the aft, this is what we'll see on the foremast. 
There's a lower squashed octagon, that's where the secondary battery control was. There were Vickers gun directors in here uh, for the five inch guns. Uh, the next squashed octagon up, that was uh, main battery control. They had a uh, battery officer up there, they also had the uh, spotters up there because once you fire, you don't always hit. So they would feed back corrections so they could see from the loft. Gun director. The gun director was just in this round cupola on top. The dowels indicate lines of sight, but we had a telescope up here that would give you target bearing. We still relied on range, keeper, uh, range finders, uh, which were optical range finders that were, first off, they were uh, split image. You remember way old cameras where you bring them up and align the image? That's what we had, and those were built into the turrets, actually, too. Later on, we had stereoscopic models, and finally, we had radar. 1941, we had a microwave radar up here, and that became the preferred way to get target range. So that's that's the source up above. There's a, an abbreviated set of this just after the stack. And that's uh, spot two. This was spot one. Uh, and then we had spot three, which was the gunnery officer's location in the conning tower. And then we had secondary directors still uh, on top of turret two. And, and turret four. They couldn't see very well, but if things went south, at least they still had them. That's how we fed the computers. Well, all well and done. Where were the computers? Well, this is the computer. Imagine, if you will, that box. As far as we know, the, the, the one that I last know the location of is on the Nevada, and they sunk that off of Hawaii after the bikini tests. Not recoverable. But it had the box underneath right there, and the signals went on out and they went out through this port. So let me go over there and we'll set this up and we'll see how we fire. Get it out to our turrets, close through this board. The section here, those bus bars, that's where the signals go in and come out. After that, we switch them. So it's the main battery board. I love it. It has the GE Schenectady 1926 camel on it. This is where we bring the signal in. It comes off there, it comes down, and we decide which of the gun directors I'm going to take it from. So I, I named the, the five gun directors aloft. We're going to select spot one, top of the four mast, and that was primary. So I'll set the switches for that. We're taking off our target bearing signal from there. We still had to call the, the range down from aloft because that's where they read the radar. Comes into the, into the computer. We had two computers, so we could divide fire. Uh, we could shoot at two different targets, track two different targets. Or we just do one. In this case, I'm just going to bring up computer one. I'm going to feed the signal from spot one into it. And I'm going to send it out to the turrets using this section down here. Set the switches. And they're set right now for turrets one and two. So I'm going to be able to fire the guns. I'm going to have a firing solution going out there. I want to fire the guns in turrets one and two. You don't want to fire everybody. So you just close the circuits for turrets one and two. And that's what this panel was about. You could set it to fire totally locally if things really went south. And that was a percussion thing. They had a backup battery out there, or they could do it by manually. Normally, we're going to fire it electrically from here, and it could be fired from any one of the gun directors. Spot one, button, two, three. Uh, I'm going to set it for just firing from spot one and only sending the firing signal out to turrets one and two. That'll send four rounds downrange. So we're we look back, we see that the directors are tracking. They're happy out there the, in the turret. They're set, they have their button. We're ready, we're, up, we're following. And up above, the uh, turret officer is looking and he's following the ship as it goes back, back, and forth. The whole idea is to fire when it's level. So it's gonna be his eye. It's gonna anticipate just before we get level and fire, so it's level in this direction. So he's looking at this, it comes up, comes level, guns go off, four rounds go down range. Granted, it would sound more like a thump down here, but that's what I got. Okay, and no, no powder was expended. Uh, all right, so down, down range, four, range, four rounds come. 1,500, uh, perhaps of armor piercing, and 1,275 with the uh, high capacity. And we look for the splashes. We had spotters up above. We might also have air spot. Normally, we might be flying our own uh, Kingfisher, and we get a radio signal back, and there's a radio telephone on the, on the aft bulkhead right over the tip. There we go. 
So we've got a signal back that's a, a VHF transceiver just uh, after the radio room. We might get a call from them. We might get it for the same frequency. We might get it off of Mustangs, off of, off of Normandy. Uh, they had a chance to fly a real, real plane that didn't get hit as easily. Uh, but we're preparing uh, for support of shore landings. They would also have uh, compatible radios on that table. That's where the corrections were put in. There'd be an officer stationed there, and his job was to decide what the correction was to put it in the computer so they'd start tracking again. Comes in the sink maybe a, a minute later, uh, try to get all set. Again, we're ready to fire. One more time, we got to the turret. Officer looks over there, we're level, bam, he fires, guns go down, and maybe we're doing well. We get a straddle, we actually get a hit. What's the likelihood of the hit? Well, if you're both ships are maneuvering, maybe one in 20. And you have to wait 15 seconds to find out, or maybe 20 seconds to find out, because that's how long it takes to get, get to range. Uh, let's say we hit, then we can go to semi continuous fire. Just say when your turret's ready, you may fire, and then the, the turret officer coordinates that. Well, now we're, we've been firing, so we're doing really well. Except the fog came in. There's all this smoke from all the good firing we're doing, and we can't see the horizon anymore. What's a guy going to do up there? He's going to pull in his sixth gun director, and that spot over there with the white plywood is where the Mark 32 gun director was located. Uh, its purpose was to provide a vertical, stable vertical, so the ship can roll like this, but the gyro knows which way is up. So we'll just simply let the ship roll and go to automatic firing, let the switch over there determine it from the gyro, when it comes level, it'll close this firing switch, and bam, the guns go off. Automatic firing. Uh, so things got a little easier if you did uh, firing in support of the Pacific, say, uh, for landings, you might have a map. So you had over here a mapping machine. You'd have a, a plot of your targets, pre-plot of your targets, and you could actually draw that out. This is a dead reckoning tracer, which takes the signal from the dead reckoning analyzer in Central Station, so it can estimate where your position is uh, without without having to survey it in and landing. Right behind me, radar. That's for position orientation. We didn't evolve, but we had the blueprints to when we had uh, radar readouts down here. So this was just for position orientation. Don is suggesting it'd be a great time to go through the state batch right up here. He's going to lead the way. Is that true? Uh, not today. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, are there any questions?